So I'm very pleased to, that we're having this um, session of Miller Repa, who I'll give, we'll give a little bit of context because I think there's a lot of people in uh, this room who, who might not know too much. Um, but first I wanted to introduce the, the panelists here. Um, we have Andrew Quintman. Andrew is a professor of religious studies at Yale University. And we're really lucky to have him here because I think he is one of the, uh, he's probably the most knowledgeable person in, in uh, academia who, uh, on Milarepa. Uh, he's written two books. He's written the, uh, or he's translated one book, which is The Life of Milarepa, which is a Penguin classic, and it's available in the, in the uh, book tent over there. And it's an amazing story, and I really, if you haven't read it, I really encourage you to read, because it's sort of the um, entryway into the world of Milarepa. He also wrote the, the book, The Yogan and the Madman, which is about the, the story of Milarepa's biographical corpus and the, the text around him. And that might sound dry, but it is an amazing story of, um, of how a text can change over time and, and, and really the, what its import is to people. It's a, it's a, it's a great demonstration of, of how things can evolve. Um, Judy Leaf is uh, the, the editor of a recent book. Can I hold up the book? Um, by Chogim Trungpa Rinpoche. Uh, and this is, this is um, Lessons from the Life and Songs of Tibet's Great Yogi. Chogim Trungpa Rinpoche, for those who don't know, was a very important uh, Tibetan teacher who came to the West. Um, he came from Tibet and then lived in India in Shimla at, the, at Frida Betty's famous school for young lamas. Um, and really, the face of Buddhism in the West was, was really marked by his presence. And lots of his uh, students are authors and teachers themselves, including Judy. Uh, she's an author in her own right as well. She wrote a book called Making Friends with Death. So uh, sort of Buddhist techniques for dealing with uh, death and dying. And then we have Tenzin Lamsang, um, who was a journalist at the Indian Express and then at the Bhutanese newspaper Kunsel before starting his own weekly newspaper in, in Bhutan called The Bhutanese, uh, which he began about six years ago. And it's, and it's great to have these different voices from the academy, from someone who's been really working with how to apply the, the lessons of Milarepa's life to today, and, and Tenzin, who comes from a culture where Milarepa is very much in the foreground of consciousness um, and, and plays a role in people's lives even today. So briefly, um, Milarepa was born in the 11th century and his story is, is a fascinating one. In many ways, he, he's an archetype for the guru-disciple relationship and we'll be talking about that in the context of, of this. And this comes this is not just a Tibetan thing from the Himalayas. This is very much, uh, the source of this is from India. So Milarepa's guru was Marpa, who actually came to India to learn the teachings. And this was something that was happening throughout that, that period of time, where Tibetans be, were really wanting to bring the, the Buddha Dharma to Tibet. And the source was India at a time when Buddhism itself was, was contracting. Um, and so, so this comes direct, what we're talking about here is happening on the Tibetan plateau, but it's very much an Indian phenomena at the same time. Um, Milarepa is still extremely popular. We just have, um, if you do a Google search, you get about a million hits on Milarepa. A lot of these things are like Milarepa guest house and, and things <laughs> like that, but it's all from um, this incredible um, figure that we're talking about today. Um, of the books that Shambhala publishes, of our Buddhist books, he's, meant, he's discussed or, or fo the focus of about 150 books. Mostly he's, he's always sort of brought in from all the different lineages of Tibetan Buddhism. Everybody loves Milarepa. He is, he's a touchstone for, for so many aspects of practicing on the Buddhist path. Um, there's been all kinds of other things, even contemporary, that have, that have come up besides the translation of these books or these new presentations of the books. Um, 
There was, a, there was a French play, there's an Italian film, there's a Tibetan film, there's, uh, uh, we're reissuing a comic book later this year of, of his life, which hopefully will become an, an, an Indian edition. Um, and I should also say that uh, Judy's Milarepa book is available in an Indian edition, and there's lots of it at the, at the tent as well. Um, with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Andy. Great. Thank you, Nico, and thanks again for everyone uh, for coming out this afternoon after a long day of uh, listening to speakers about books and about literature. So I think if we can say that Milarepa is the Tibetan Buddhist and the Himalayan Buddhist saint who is most loved and best remembered, the archetype for what it means to be uh, a mendicant and a meditator and a poet, I think it's also fair to say that his life story, the life of Milarepa, that's translated in this Penguin Classics edition, is Tibet's most famous book. And the story is one of uh, the Buddhist world's greatest liberation narratives. It becomes the archetype for almost every liberation story that followed in the Tibetan Buddhist world. It's hard to overstate uh, the position that this story played in the literary landscape of the Tibetan and Himalayan Buddhist world. So what I'd like to do, I uh, spend a few minutes to sketch out the life of Milarepa by a few selected readings from his life story. This is from the translation of a text that was written in 1488. So the story that I'm reading to you was written about 400 years after he died. So the story begins uh, in southern Tibet, very close to the border of Nepal. Milarepa was born into a family that was quite wealthy, and in his youth, his family's wealth uh, was famously stolen by his aunt and uncle after the death of his father. And so the story of this great liberation tale begins in a somewhat unusual way. It begins with Milarepa's mother telling her son, who's a young child of about 16, to exact revenge upon his greedy aunt and uncle. And they do it in a very special kind of Tibetan way. She tells his son to go and study black magic so that he can exact revenge. And I want to read you a passage in which the mother tells her son to go off and study black magic just because this seems so unusual for a tale of great spiritual liberation. So the mother says to his son, I would like to see you draped in a fine cloak and mounted upon a horse with your stirrups slashing the throats of our hated enemies. Such will not come to pass, yet success is still possible by means of treachery. So I would like you to train to become an expert in black magic, in curses, and casting hail. Then you should destroy all those who inflicted misery on us, villagers and countrymen, beginning with your uncle and aunt, cutting off their family lines for nine generations. Son, if you return without showing signs of black magic in our region, I, your old mother, will kill myself in front of you." <laughs> well, this was a strong motivation for Milarepa, and he did indeed uh, travel uh, to study black magic, and very famously sent a curse upon his homeland and killed uh, about 38 people from his aunt and uncle's family, uh, during a wedding feast, spares the aunt and uncle so that they can spread the message of the revenge that he exacted. Uh, he then uh, casts a hailstorm that buries his village up to the rooftops of their houses so that their crops are completely demolished. So he really does a number on his old village men. But then, of course, uh, we start to see the liberation tale take shape. Milarepa feels great remorse about the terrible deeds that he's, uh, he's carried out and the terrible karmic consequences of his actions. And so he writes, I felt remorse for evils I had committed through casting black magic in hailstorms. I thought about dharma so intensely that during the day I forgot to eat. If I went out, I wanted to stay in. If I stayed in, I wanted to go out. At night, I was so filled with world weariness and renunciation that I was unable to sleep. So we see this kind of pathos of the human emotion in this figure who's so tormented by the, the horrendous deeds he's done in, in, in his youth that's starting to motivate him to carry out the spiritual path. Andy, can I just ask you one question? Yeah. You, you say, you, you're, you're saying liberation. So 
can you explain that a little bit? I mean, there's this idea of the, of the text being with a uh, hagiography is, right. is how it's translated in English, which right. means in Tibetan, Namtar, Sanskrit, Vimoksha. Can you talk right. a little bit about that? So right, so the story of the life of Milarepa is one example of, a, of an enormous genre of writing. In Tibetan, called Namtar, it means liberation. So ostensibly, it's the story of an individual's liberation. It's not focused on the mundane affairs uh, it's not really an intellectual biography in the Western sense, but it's the story of the figure's renunciation of the ordinary world and his practice of the spiritual path and his eventual awakening. And that's exactly what we find in this story. What's so unusual about this example is that it's so filled with human emotion and with details of Milarepa's ordinary life that it makes really exciting reading. It's like reading a novel, like a 15th century novel that's filled with suspense and humor and pathos and emotion. Uh, it's one of the things that makes it such a gripping story. So, uh, Milarepa eventually finds a teacher, or is, is looking for a teacher, and he thinks to himself, I had provisions and gifts when I carried out evil deeds. When I practiced Dharma, I have no wealth at all. This is what has befallen me. Even if I had half the gold I used when I practiced evil deeds, I would obtain initiation and, uh, and the practice. Without wealth, I will never get the Dharma. A human body without Dharma fosters evil deeds. I wanted to kill myself. What to do? What to do? So again, this intense yearning for, uh, for the practice of the spiritual path. And so eventually, Milarepa meets his predestined guru, this figure named Marpa, who was a great translator of Sanskrit texts. He traveled three times to Nepal and India, where he gathered an enormous corpus of Indian uh, Buddhist texts, mostly tantric texts. He brought back to, uh, to Tibet and translated them. He spends years training with his guru, undergoing arduous uh, kind of training techniques. He's forced to carry out the, these uh, very difficult trials of building uh, towers. It drinks him to the, brings him to the brink of, of death. But eventually, uh, he's set forth on the path by his guru to live the rest of his life in solitary meditation, to wander the Himalayan mountainsides of forest retreats, to dedicate himself uh, to uh, contemplative practice. And the first thing he does is return to his homeland in search of what remains of his family. And there's this incredible moment where he finds the remains of his mother in the ruins of his family's estate. So I want to read you this passage. I walked across the doorstep and found a heap of rags caked with dirt over which many weeds had grown. When I gathered them up, a number of human bones, bleached white, slipped out. When I realized they were the bones of my mother, I was so overcome with grief that I could hardly stand it. I couldn't think. I couldn't speak and an overwhelming sense of longing and sadness swept over me. I was on the verge of fainting. When I was translating this passage, it was a very emotional moment for me as well. Um, so Milarepa, this, this sign of impermanence is another encouragement for him to devote himself to meditation. After his first attempt at meditation, he has this incredible uh, uh, sort of wellspring of of, uh, of emotion about the nature of emptiness. And he does something for which he would become famous for many centuries later, and that is he composes his first poem. Milarepa was a great poem, and there's a whole volume of poetry attributed to him, some of which I've translated in this text. So this is one, line, uh, one uh, uh, section from his first poem about, about impermanence. Alas, alas, I me, I me, how sad. People invested in things of life's round, I reflect and reflect, and again and again I despair. They act and they act and they stir up from their depths so much torrent. They spin and they spin and are cast in the depths of life's round. Those dragged on by karma, afflicted with anguish like this, what to do, what to do? There's no cure but the Dharma. Lord Akshobhya in presence, Vajradhara is guru. Bless this beggar to stay in mountain retreat. And that, in fact, is what he does for the rest of his life, uh, some 40 or 50 years. He lives the rest of his life wearing nothing but a single cotton robe by, from which he, his name springs. Repa means the person who wears just a single cotton 
cloth robe. Um, he meditates in solitude. In and, cold places. In very cold places. This was a sign of great meditative attainment when you could raise your body temperature enough so that you could sustain uh, your life, even in the harshest winter uh, in the Himalayan mountains. So I want to read you just one poem from later in his life to give you a sense of his poetry and the kind of mental state that he developed. And this is a, a really moving poem about what it is to live a life of solitude where you're so detached from the interests of the world that your greatest aspiration is to meditate in solitude and in fact to die in solitude with no one around. My happiness unknown to loved ones and misery unknown to foes, if thus I can die in this mountain retreat, the aims of this yogin will be complete. My aging unknown to companions and sickness unknown to my sister, if thus I can die in this mountain retreat, the aims of this yogin will be complete. My death unknown among people and rotting corpse unseen by vultures, if thus I can die in this mountain retreat, the aims of this yogin will be replete. Flies sucking on my putrid flesh and insects gnawing my bones. If thus I can die in this mountain retreat, the aims of this yogin will be complete. No footprint at my doorstep and no sign of blood inside. If thus I can die in this mountain retreat, the aims of this yogin will be complete. May the prayer of this beggar to die in a cave of some remote locale be cast for the benefit of beings when cast my aims are fulfilled. And so he managed to live out his greatest aspirations. He spent the rest of his life in solitary meditation, composing poems uh, based on his uh, realization of, uh, of the true nature of reality, of suffering, of impermanence, of karma. Um, he trained many, teacher, uh, many students, and he went on to found a kind of spiritual movement that would last for generations. And before uh, we move on to the kind of contemporary re reverberations of Milarepa, let me just end by saying that the story of Milarepa itself uh, became so important in part because it was written some 400 years after he died by a very charismatic and important figure who referred to himself as the madman from Western Tibet, Tsong Nguyen Haruka. He was interesting for many reasons, but he himself was a great literateur. He was a great poet, a great author. He took the kind of raw material of the deeds that Milarepa had done, the outline of his story and his poetry, and he crafted this story that would become a great example of world literature. I was so pleased that this translation came out in Penguin Classics so that it stands beside other great works of world literature because I think it really deserves that position. And it's in part because of this 15th century spiritual madman that the story of Milarepa uh, continues to remain a vibrant and living tradition both in Asian Buddhist cultures but also in the West. So I think we'll, we'll stop there and uh, we'll, we'll continue the conversation. Thanks, Andy. Yeah. <laughs> so let's hear from you, Judy. I, <clears throat> thank you, Andy. <laughs> um, the story of Milarepa is, is uh, not only central and pivotal to those uh, practitioners of the Buddha Dharma in the East, but also played a pivotal role in the introduction of Buddha Dharma in Western cultures in the 70s. Um, when uh, Western students started taking up uh, practice of Buddhism, there were very few uh, books available in English that had been translated. Uh, and one of the ones that had the most impact for early students in those days were the songs of Milarepa. And Milarepa, was not a poet in the sense we think of, of poetry, I don't think. He was a spontaneous spoken poet. Uh, that was how he communicated his teachings. So he was not the kind of teacher who uh, created tomes or established uh, institutions or um, anything like that. But he responded to immediately to the situations that presented themselves to him in a spontaneous and poetic uh, inspired way. 
uh, he was, um, you could say, well, what's the relevance of someone in the 11th century for 20th century people? Very different culture, very different uh, uh, world situation. And, uh, and when I encountered the teachings of Milarepa through my guru, uh, Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche, he made a, a big point about um, uh, not viewing this as some kind of quaint or historic person from an exotic culture having nothing to do with us. He said the, the um, example of Milarepa, but also the teachings, uh, filled with teachings, his songs, are very relevant to those people particularly interested in the meditation tradition and in the practice of silent meditation and retreat. So uh, he gave, it was actually it was so important to Trungpa Rinpoche that it's actually the very second teaching he gave in the West was on Milarepa and his songs. Uh, at that time, we didn't have wonderful translations from Andy, but we had a starting point with a pivotal work by um, Gurma C.C. Chang, who did a, a, a version of the songs of Milarepa. For which and there's now a new translation. There's a new as well. translation with Trimbala Publications, Trimbala. which is uh, Excellent. much better. <laughs> but uh, still, I appreciate that there was an earlier version to, to riff off of. But uh, interestingly enough, nowadays in the West, people still sing Milarepa songs. They still um, uh, benefit greatly from them. And um, I'd like to, in this particular book, this uh, book on Milarepa, part of the book is talking about touching on Milarepa's life, and there is some uh, commentary on, on some of the songs. But the real emphasis on the book is that the similar kind of situations Milarepa had, we also encounter in contemporary life. And the outrageous, the outrageous story of what we would call a mass murder making a journey to uh, the highest attainments of a uh, meditative path. So uh, at, at the very least, it's a sign of, well, if Milarepa could do it, yeah. <laughs> you know, you know uh, if a mass murderer could do it, it makes you think twice about views of the spiritual path. In fact, on, on the Wikipedia page for Milarepa, one of the tags used to be mass murderers. Yeah. <laughs> I think somebody <laughs> got around to changing that. But. Yeah. but I think often we think that the path is for special people who don't have any problems and have some kind of spiritual quality that is, that's not like normal people. And those special people can become teachers and, and follow the spiritual path. But at the very ground level, the story of Milarepa points to the fact, don't, don't um, pigeonhole your views of what is a spiritual attainment and who is uh, worthy of a spiritual attainment and who has that spiritual abilities. Uh, a basic teaching within Buddhism is that all beings have Buddha nature. All beings are capable of uh, awakening, no matter what you've done, no matter what mistakes you've made, no matter what your circumstances, high or low, or this way or that way. So it's encouraging that way for sure. Um, and there's a few themes that um, Trungpa Rinpoche emphasizes that are also related to some of the stories and some of the points that Andy made. And one of them is a very interesting again, in terms of stages of the spiritual path and the kind of the, the living quality, the human quality, the, the feeling and emotional quality, which is not the philosophical understanding, but it's a lived experience, comes through meditative practice and from taking a certain kind of interest in life. So in talking about seeing Milarepa going back to his village and encountering the ruins of his uh, uh, house, his mother's bones, and the library destroyed and eaten by rats and, and whatnot, uh, connects with um, uh, an interesting quality that I was taught was so important in spirituality, which is disappointment. Hmm. Disappointment. <laughs> and uh, so this little reading is about different aspects of disappointment as pivotal in Milarepa's journey. 
Um, so, at the beginning, not only was Milarepa disappointed about getting into spirituality, because he had to do all those building projects, but it was also disappointing to realize that Marpa was a mere farmer rather than a holy man coming from India to Tibet. Marpa did regular jobs. This is Milarepa's guru. He cultivated his fields, went up into the mountains, took care of his dairy farm, made payments to the servants, and ran the household details, as well as teaching at the same time. So Marpa's ordinariness was a starting point. He did not seem to be a highly mystical, enlightened holy man, as one would expect but he was a very ordinary person. He was a very simple and down-to-earth person who cared a great deal about his wealth and his initiation fees, a person who cared about his farm and his animals and his family. So disappointment is a starting point. It is merely a starting point. Having been disappointed, you then need to give in to that. You need to accept the whole thing. You, you need to say, Okay, even this is okay. I'm willing to accept these things. But that too is not enough. Beyond that, there is a very subtle level of disappointment, almost in the form of punishment. In terms of existing or maintaining your ego, the more of an ego stronghold there is, the more of an operation is needed. And since Milarepa was a very extreme person at the time, he needed to have more chances to realize and to give up his wishful thinking and hopefulness. That played a very important part. So we could say that it is necessa necessary to experience disappointment at the beginning of the spiritual journey. After that, you also have to destroy the philosophical adjustments you might make because of that disappointment. For example, you could find your teacher or spiritual friend to be an ordinary person, you might say, it's because they're so extraordinary that they are ordinary. <laughs> and it is because of that that you think, I'm willing to accept anything that happens. We tend to develop philosophical attitudes like that. We find ways to adapt to the situation. And once we have adapted, we think, now I'm going to be saved. Anything I need to do beyond that, I have already done. Therefore, I could receive a gift without exchanging anything or giving anything on my part. So we need a second kind of disappointment, almost in the form of an execution, so to speak. We need a stripping of the skin of ego, a tearing out of its bone structure, an unmasking of everything that we try to hide behind, such as the philosophy we have developed. Such an execution becomes extremely important. That is the experience that Milarepa had and it also could be applicable to your own life. <laughs> Entering into spirituality requires unmasking your mask. And the pride that you develop by having unmasked becomes another mask. So we have to unmask that as well. <laughs> so uh, that's kind of a shocking quality and interesting uh, that, that sense of disappointment is mirrored in uh, encounter with uh, Milarepa's, uh, one of his closest disciples, Rachungpa, who Milarepa raised from uh, young uh, boyhood. Rachungpa uh, was sent by Milarepa to India to gather some uh, teachings that he had not been able to gather. So at that point, uh, Tibetan Buddhism was a def definitely a direct import from India. and. Uh, it was developed because of the many uh, translators working to bring that teachings from India into the Tibetan uh, vernacular. But when, uh, Mil when uh, Rachungpa had seen all the glories of the great gurus in India, uh, he's come back to Tibet, and then he had this Tibetan guy. He was very disappointed and thought, well, he's not so great as all the Indians. So he also had to go through uh, an adjustment of thinking about, well, it's sort of like now that I've seen Perry, how I'm going to keep me uh, back on the farm uh, in, in uh, more rugged uh, and early stages of Buddhism in, in Tibet. So he also went through that uh, uh, experience of disappointment. And I wanted to touch on one other story to give a, a flavor of some of these teachings. And before moving on, 
And uh, uh, much of what you'll find in this book and in the Milarepa stories altogether is uh, many, many um, uh, insights into the uh, guru-student relationship and what is teaching all about. Um, one thing is very obvious is that the limited notion you think of teaching of a great teacher, you go to some kind of program or a talk and then someone gives an inspiring presentation and, and then, uh, or you go to a great uh, temple or a uh, um, special place and, and hear uh, lectures or demonstrations of this or that. But so much of Milarepa's teaching is what um, uh, Rinpoche, Trungpa Rinpoche refers to as situational teaching. It's on-the-spot teaching, working with the situation at hand. So it's not a formal lecture. It's not written in books. It uh, can be in a very, very ordinary interactions that uh, the teachings come through directly in the meeting of the student and the teacher, uh, sometimes in unexpected and uh, different kind of ways. So one of my favorite... Um, um, examples of this is uh, Milarepa and uh, Richungpa were uh, walking along. Milarepa was always going from one place to another, this cave to that cave, and even though you could say he led a solitary life, because of who he was, he didn't, because all sorts of students found him. <laughs> but anyway, uh, so Richungpa was always sort of tagging along, and Milarepa was doing various things to kind of uh, freak him out. And in this particular case, they were walking along in Milarepa. This is in the period when Rachunko was thinking, this is an old Tibetan guy, what, what am I doing? Uh, Milarepa picked up a, a, um, a, a, a yak horn. He picked up a yak horn that is lying on this field. And Rachunko was thinking, why would you pick up this useless thing with such a dumb thing to do? And he's like grumping along. And Milarepa said, you know, I want to pick up this yak horn and take it with you. And so they were walking along in this uh, big open space, and it started to be rain, and it started to blasting down hail. There's a lot of hail storms in Tibet. So a bunch of hail was coming down. There were no trees around. And uh, so Rachungpa was looking around for somehow to find some kind of shelter. And he looks around, and there's no Milarepa's not there. But he was just walking together. He was looking around, and then he hears a little noise, and he said, where is Milarepa? Uh, Milarepa's inside the yakhorn. He's inside, it's completely safe from the hailstorm. He went inside the yakhorn, and Rishinko was being belted with hail in the meantime. <laughs> so anyway, I read a little section about this story, which is very revealing in terms of uh, how we perceive things in rigid or, or um, open ways, perhaps. The, so when Milarepa and Richungpa got to Palamo Paltong, which is one of very famous field or big open plains in Tibet, rain and hail started coming down. Richungpa got so confused and excited about all that was happening that he completely forgot Milarepa, his guru. Richungpa had regarded Milarepa's collecting of yak horns as very childish, and this phrase came to his mind. When dogs get old, they get more hot-tempered. When men get old, they get more passionate and possessive. But while Richungpa was being pelted by hail, it turned out that Milarepa was safe inside the horn. In this story, although Milarepa was sitting in a yak horn, the interesting point is that the yak horn did not become bigger and Milarepa did not become smaller. Th that is an important point in relation to miracles. A miracle is not just a magic show or a conjuring trick. You cannot miraculously change water into fire, and you cannot go against the force of nature or the force of karmic power. Miracles only, can only occur with certain mental meeting points or hallucinations. Such hallucinations or mental meeting points could turn an ordinary situation into a miracle. That is why it is particularly interesting that Milarepa never got smaller and the acorn never became bigger. If you examine Milarepa's figure and you examine the horn, you would just see a yak horn and Milarepa, just natural, ordinary things as they are. <laughs> 
But the strange coincidence is that being as they are, they were somehow able to fit into one another. With this kind of hallucination, you could fit everything into that yak horn. You could build a gigantic universe on one bubble within that universe, without that universe becoming smaller or the bubble becoming bigger. <laughs> Thanks, Judy. Okay. Um, before we move on, I just, I, I remember that story of uh, Rachungpa coming back from India and he brought a bunch of texts with him. And I know the story varies from, from source to source, but he had these texts on logic and, Milare and Milarepa, when Rachungpa went away or something, he took all the texts on logic and burned them. <laughs> and he said he, he wanted Rachungpa to wear out his cushion meditating, not wear out his shoes walking around talking scholarly stuff. Can you talk a little bit about uh, how Trungpa Rinpoche sort of presented that dynamic between sort of study and practice to you guys in the 70s and 80s? Like how did, how did, how was that sort of presented? Well, I think the uh, term for Rinpoche presented, for one thing, the extreme importance of joining study and practice, that study without practice would lead to arrogance and just a conceptual understanding without much depth. Practice without study could uh, lead to kind of spaced out meditator kind of person. So, the st study and the practice um, are totally united and complementary. Um, study sharpens the mind. Practice lessens the uh, emotional disturbance. So they're very important to, to be joined together. He also uh, had a, a major theme of not relying on uh, pre preconceptions of any sort as to what spirituality is about, what the path is about, um, and that those, our tendency to want to solidify our world and within sets of preconceptions was a real hindrance and very difficult to uh, interrupt without um, uh, a teacher who's willing to uh, undermine the creation of those conceptual uh, traps. So he made a, a big emphasis on uh, coming to, to terms and coming to experience a certain quality of groundlessness, a certain quality of unknowing, a certain quality of uh, unpackaged direct experience. And uh, in fact, uh, another important uh, the way Millerip represented to us was in terms of the uh, meditative tradition called the Mahamudra, which is very much based on uh, overcoming um, all or, or cutting through or seeing through the many veils and, and distortions and colorations that we have about ourselves, one another, and, and the world around us. And uh, uh, on a simple level, getting beyond just trying to think our way out of life uh, and more important to, to feel our way directly into the kind of vividness and, and uh, horrors and the wonders of uh, living in this world as we are. Great. Thank you, Judy. Yeah. Um, so as Andy alluded to, Milarepa sort of founded this whole or, or was really kind of expanded um, this tradition that, that became what's called the Kagyu tradition. Um, but Milarepa is loved by everybody across the board, as I was saying. But the, the Kagyu tradition um, is, is extremely strong in Bhutan. It's, it's um, sort of the state, although there's other traditions there, it's, it's a very strong tradition. So Tenzin, can you share a little bit about who Milarepa is to the Bhutanese people and, and how, how they sort of see him and relate to him? Well, uh, uh, Milarepa, when I uh, used to talk to my uh, late uh, grandmother and my, and my mother, I will, I mean, uh, 
you should uh, there's always the response used to be always be a surge of uh, energy milarepa the, the name itself because uh, this is the story of an ordinary guy you know uh, could be any of us uh, in his lifetime he had uh, insecurities about wealth uh, his uh, uncle and auntie taking away his family property uh, which his father had left under their care for him and then being mistreated then taking revenge uh, and then in that same lifetime achieving enlightenment so he is a great uh, hero in the buddhist uh, tibetan buddhist uh, uh, culture and uh, not only a hero but he didn't aspire to actually establish uh, a lineage uh, like in the hindus you have uh, uh, vishnu people who follow vishnu people who follow shiva and then you have various sects uh, in hinduism so similarly in buddhism we have different uh, schools or sects and milarepa in his lifetime didn't establish it but his followers after him uh, they established the kagyu sect which is one of the main sects of of, of buddhism and that sect eventually has subsects and one of the subsects called the drupa kagyu uh, which you can trace it back to the main disciple of uh, milarepa gampopa he uh, i hope i got the pronunciation right <laughs> anyhow yeah. but uh, he uh, one of his that the drupakaju sect came to bhutan in the in the uh, 17th uh, century and that is under with uh, jabdu nawang namgil who was one of the uh, one of the trukus or one of the uh, gurus of this sect and he unified bhutan which at the time had different uh, buddhism schools in different valleys and established the first theocratic state uh, of bhutan which survives even to this day so uh, milarepa's legacy among the common people is is that of a hero uh, and in uh, tibetan buddhism there are very few character few characters or few uh, people with his level of prestige with his level of achievements i mean uh, you have the gods as in uh, buddha but though in buddhism we say we don't have a god uh, but uh, for argument's sake we have buddha then you have uh, in between you know guru who's supposed to be the various emanations of buddha uh, and then you have the uh, the buddhist uh, leaders of of various kinds and then but milarepa is someone who is uh, almost godlike for 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 buddhist and this cut, cuts across sects though he established his teachings established the kagyu sect uh, his uh, Uh, his prestige his persona and he's followed across various buddhist sects that's his that's his <laughs> achievement in 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 many ways and uh, to give you all some uh, perspective uh, uh, what with, with regard to uh, buddhism uh, and, and 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 the lineage that uh, milarepa brought forth later um in tibet in the 7th century uh, up to almost uh, the 9th century uh, was basically buddhism was not very secure and well placed in tibet you know and uh, tibet at that time from the 7th century onwards you had various clans coming together and forming an empire uh, they had around uh, three major wars with china which uh, i think they won and in, in one case they invaded uh, the chinese uh, capital city changan at that time so tibet at that time was not a buddhist country it was a, a warrior nation uh, a bit like the mongols <coughs> and uh, in fact the early invaders destroyed buddhist sites because buddhism had reached places like kotan and uh, nearby places they destroyed buddhist sites because it didn't adhere to their born religion which is uh, more shamanistic in nature it was only later that uh, the, the the first tibetan king uh, uh, sonseng gampo the first uh, emperor of the empire uh, which is quite big which extended all the way from afghanistan uh, samarkand to, uh, to 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 china uh and central asia so he uh, adopted buddhism but even then it wasn't uh, very popular and uh, buddhism saw its uh, ups and downs through various emperors yeah and it's interesting that uh, the emperor trisim dosen who is uh, songsen gampo's uh, descendant the one, one of the great emperors uh, who also fought and won a war with china uh, he poured in a lot of energy into buddhism and when he came into power the person opposing him the minister opposing him was from the anti buddhist sect in court there were two power centers so he uh, had a religious reason 
a political reason as well to fix up this guy. And for him to fix this guy up was to get the, to, to support the pro-Buddhist uh, ministers who supported him into power, you know. Uh, because at that time the throne wasn't guaranteed, you had to fight for it. So there is a political element uh, to, to, to Buddhism in Tibet and then and even the end of the Tibetan Empire in the 9th century was when the last emperor was, uh, last emperor happened to not support Buddhism again for political reasons. And a Buddhist monk in fact assassinated him, the empire uh, kind of broke down. But after that the amount of resources that were put in between by various emperors, that had a lasting legacy followed by later rulers as well, which is how and at that point, uh, during the last, uh, during the, one of the great uh, emperor's time, the choice was between China and India. From where do we get Buddhism teachings? And uh, Tibet decided that India is the more pristine uh, source and decided to get uh, a lot of the teachers and translators from India. And Milarepa came uh, in the 11th uh, century and uh, it was a time when Buddhism was in the Renaissance. So just to give you all some perspective uh, of, of, of the historicity of this, uh, of this period. Yeah. So, so Tenzin, I think one, one thing that some people talk about, it's sort of the, the, the general narrative of Buddhism's collapse in um, India was that the Mughals came and, and various forces. But an, another in, way, way I've heard it presented is that because it was so monastic that when there were these, when these people did come in, it was easy to wipe Buddhism out. You wipe out the monasteries. One thing that's very interesting about Milarepa is it's, it's, he's everybody, he's all of us. He has all these foibles and faults and, and, and it's more relatable, right? So I'm just, uh, just a few more words because uh, we're gonna take some questions in just a minute on, on how, how people in Bhutan kind of see him. I mean, he's this, very difficult act to follow, you know, <laughs> building these towers and his back bleeding from carrying these rocks and stuff like that. So it's a little bit hard to measure up, yet he's still <laughs> beloved and, and very much in the center of things. Can you just say a few words about that and then we'll switch yeah. to some questions. I think uh, a quick point on that. Uh, Milarepa, you're right in the sense that the weakness of Buddhism, and I think which is why Buddhism, uh, which is once a preeminent, one of the preeminent religions in India, declined is because it's very monastic focused. It, it's not about inclusion, you know, uh, it's, it's, it's not very community centric. So that was the weakness. And I think Milarepa stands out in that respect because he was actually a hero. Uh, he could, the, the common masses could identify with him, you know, and there are a few other heroes like him, not as great as him, who went out and who slept with women and, and, and all of that, but he, they could correlate with the masses and the masses could correlate with him, and, yeah. Oh, and, and, and I would just add that uh, when this story was written, when this version of the story was written in the 15th century, was a period in which monasticism was deeply entrenched in Tibet and was on the rise with, the, with these uh, reincarnate lamas at, at the center. And the author of this book, the madman of Tsang, was very conscientiously returning back to the kind of roots of Buddhism in Tibet, which is in the practice of meditation, the solitary mendicant living in mountain caves and wandering in the jungles. All right, thank you guys so much. So now we're gonna open it up to questions uh, right over here. Mike's on the way, yeah. Thank you so much uh, for the question to Professor Wintman. Um, you know, as multiple people pointed Sorry, out, uh, the, uh, a, lot of Eastern, a lot of Eastern spiritual traditions um, have a certain anti-intellectual bent um, as pointed out by ma'am over there, that, uh, you know, burn these texts on logic. Uh, so I'm very curious, how do you reconcile um, this kind of motif with the tradition in, um, uh, you know, modern universities of a, a very intellectual dissection of the world? Right. And how can we adopt perhaps both approaches um, today? Good question. Thank you for that question. I think uh, there's a good answer, and in fact, Judy uh, alluded to this in the teachings of Trigam Trungpa, that uh, you really need to combine study and practice, that without some level of study and intellectual development, then you don't know what the practice is or how to do it. Without actually doing the practice, you only live in the mind. You never look beyond 
that. So the short answer is that you need to balance both of them. This particular story, the life of Milarepa, is really an example about the virtues of practice. But I think all traditions of Buddhism in the Tibetan Himalayan world uh, understand that there needs to be a combination of both and that they need to be worked together. I don't know if you have anything you want to add to that. Yeah, there's a, a, some of the uh, songs are, are, are particularly about logicians meeting Milarepa, and there's kind of a Dharma combat happens. Yeah, it's a common, it's a common, it's a, yeah. com dynamic. common trope. Yeah, and common stories, and and um, it wasn't that Milarepa was anti-intellectual, but he was able to to kind of demonstrate the limits of the intellect, right. as well as the value of the intellect. So there was a uh, kind of preconception of how one becomes learned in the tradition. And Milarepa demonstrated that there's a greater depth possible uh, in regard to that. So uh, intellect and logic are very highly valued, but there's also very much seen as uh, uh, insufficient in and of itself. And I think, particularly in the West, I mean, Trungpa Rinpoche used to say all the time, you guys think too much. And again, it wasn't uh, anti-intellectual uh, comment, but I think because people are so verbal, so educated, and so clever, that it's very easy to think we understand things that we actually have no clue about. Because we haven't, it's not embodied in us. It's up here. It's not in the heart. It's not in the blood and the marrow. But this is a, I don't know if debate's the right word, but it happens it's every ongoing. day still. An ongoing yeah. conversation. Yeah. There's another question back here. Uh, yeah. Can you hear Thank me? you for well, the opportunity. Maybe, maybe the guy in the front first, and then we'll go back. Yeah. Yes. I have rather two questions, if you would allow. One, one question. Okay, I'll uh, uh, straight away go to the part where uh, Judy was telling us about the uh, constant disappointment of uh, Milarepa, you know. So uh, I just wanted to know, does Milarepa constant, uh, Milarepa's constant disappointment during his kind of internship period under the, his guru Marpa suggest that Marpa had not accepted him as his disciple? And if it was so, why it was so? And factually, did Milarepa attain enlightenment by his own natural spiritual instincts? Is that the disappointment of seeing Marpa? Yeah, so, what, what, so you read that passage about the disappointment. Yeah. It's, it's a little hard yeah. for us to hear up here yeah. just because of the monitors. Okay. I, I think the okay. question was clear before. Okay, I can uh, give a temporary, I mean, a contemporary example of that same thing of disappointment that happened very often with my own teacher, uh, Chogyam Trungpa Rinpoche, because he did not manifest as, as what people expect, as a, 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 a hierarch, a Tibetan uh, tradition with robes and a particular way of being, you know, people imagine a saintly people. The notion of in the West that have a very solid view of saintly people are uh, this way. They talk, they're really nice, nothing bothers them, they have beautiful robes, and that's a, you know, the, the romantic notion of the spiritual uh, direction, the spiritual leader. And so uh, many people I know, when they, they'd heard stories about this great teacher, Trungpa Rinpoche, and then they meet him wearing a suit, dressed like a Westerner, smoking a cigarette, and they think, what? <laughs> Like, how can that be? So there's, they immediately experience that same thing of like disappointment and kind of scrambles you like, okay, uh, what actually are you looking for? You know, are you looking for this fantasy uh, or are you willing to engage with a real human right in front of you? <laughs> in the back? Uh, it seems that the overall aspect of uh, how Milarepa has gone through throughout his life, I think it, it, it's, it's, uh, it seems quite realistic. Uh, there are different aspects of his life, uh, the intellect part, uh, the practice, uh, the disappointments, and after that, what he achieves, it, it makes a lot of sense. But my question basically is like, as you mentioned, it's been 1400 uh, years ago, it's been written. Uh, 
a lot of translations. Uh, 400 years after that, somebody wrote it. You have translations, different languages, different dialects. Don't you see somewhere the, the real meaning or the real story gets diluted somewhere? Can you, I mean, it, it, it implies to any, any, uh, any religion, any book, any history, any language, any aspect of uh, history. It seems that when you move on, it gets diluted somewhere because, you know, when you, when I, when you are telling me a story and maybe I go home and tell my mom that, you know, this is what I heard about it. I might not be able to translate the same way. I would, the, the message would be diluted somewhere. So the span of 400 years, 1400 years is, is massive. If you can look back and see what you have got on the paper, might be somewhere diluted by 30%, 40% or something like that. Yeah. That's what I mean. But I would say, you know, my, my experience with different spiritualities, different books, I see some, some not, not but some, but a lot of sense in what Ms. Ms. Judy also mentioned about, uh, you know, how a spiritual practice is carried out. So if we see quite relevant, but, you know, there is another aspect that, yes, uh, there might be some, you know, dilution in, in the knowledge, in the practice, in the, the story, in the information given. Well, what's your say about it? What's your say about it? How do you see it? I didn't really so, get it. Uh, yeah, so uh, it's, it's a bit hard to hear from the monitor here, but I'm also not exactly sure what the question, like if you could just phrase the question very succinctly, then. I'll make it very brief for you. Yeah. Uh, I mean to say, uh, you have written this book now. Anybody would have written it, but after 400 years of writing, the message gets diluted somewhere. So, the reason being because of the language, the time, the people who wrote it in different languages. And so, so, yeah. so, so he's asking about the or yeah. the, where, where does yeah. the real Milarepa lie? Well, that's a very yeah. interesting question, yeah. um, and it's one you that you should is, read Andy's book. Yeah. So I wrote a book about this <laughs> question. That that's the Yogan and the Madman, um, and the short answer is that we have no idea who the real Milarepa was, or what he said, or where he did, or wh where he went or what he did, in the same way that we don't really know who the Buddha was, or where he went, or what he said, because like Milarepa, the words of the Buddha weren't written down there was no YouTube. until many hundreds of years later. They weren't live streaming him on Facebook at the time. Um, and yet, that doesn't mean that, the, the, uh, that there isn't a figure of Milarepa that is the great source of inspiration and pride and uh, motivation for continuing communities of Buddhist practitioners in Asia and the West is still very much a living tradition. There's also a question of efficacy. When we get into some of these things, whether there's, things are historically c correct, or did he actually shrink to the size where he could get into a yakhorn, <laughs> it's a little bit beside the point, in a sense, because the question, the, the, they would say the, the, the tradition is like, it, he, you know, there's all these stories, but the point is, this path works. Mm -hmm. and, and that's an important thing to keep in mind if, you know, if you get to something that you get stuck on, like, well, this biography said one thing, this biography said another, um, and, and things that, that sort of like push your concepts to the point where you're not, not comfortable, kind of, it makes you want to push it away. Um, there's something to that, too. Just right, so one of the main arguments that I make in The Yogan and the Mad Men in my other book is that if you're wondering who the real Milarepa <laughs> was, it's the wrong question to ask. What's the power behind the story of Milarepa and the message of Milarepa? That's a much more interesting and fruitful line of questioning. Yeah. Um, we've got one, one more question. Can we do one more question? Or No, we can't do one more question, but we'll be over here. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody, for coming. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you.